Okay, so I've seen quite a few comments asking about making Minecraft in Python, particularly using Ursina Engine, so I figured it would be worth making a video talking about this. While a basic version can be made very easily, as you've probably seen in other videos on YouTube, optimising it to run for larger terrain is a lot more time consuming and complicated. So rather than writing it line by line, Today we're going to look at the overall process, so that you can then create your own implementation of it in the future. When looking at this process, there are three main areas we need to focus on. We need to generate a mesh for each chunk. We need to generate the actual terrain for the mesh to display. And we need collision detection with these blocks that make up the terrain. To start with, let's focus on how we generate our mesh. When treating each block as an entity, as you've probably seen before, things get really slow. And that makes sense. For each cube there are six faces. And there's a lot of entities, so a lot of cubes, so a lot of faces. When we are trying to optimise everything, this is pretty bad. Imagine a 16 by 16 by 16 block chunk. That's up to 24,576 faces, and a lot of them don't even need to exist until they are uncovered by the player digging. From this, we know we need to move away from the entity approach, and start using an entity per chunk instead of an entity per block. This means we're going to need to find a way to store the block data for the whole chunk as each block can't be stored as its own object anymore, or its own entity. The obvious answer is a three-dimensional array, or list, depending on what you want to call it in Python. If you're struggling to get your head around a 3D list, conveniently, a good way of visualising it is actually with blocks. To start off with, we have a single dimensional list, as you can see here, with the indexes starting at zero, and counting up. Now what if we placed a list as each item in our current list? This is what we call a two-dimensional list, as it is extending both horizontally and vertically. So we need to pass it two indexes, or two coordinates if you want to call it that, to obtain each value from our list. Now finally, what if we added more lists to replace each item? Now our data structure extends in three dimensions, so we can use it perfectly to store what blocks are where within our chunk, and each index can just correspond to a certain coordinate. Now that's sorted, we just need to generate our mesh. This is achieved by passing the vertices, the corners of each face, to our mesh class. Then we just need to tell it how to connect these up by passing it lists of these vertices. For example, if we wanted to create a cube, we could first list out the vertices and then say when you connect vertex 0, 1, 2 and 3 up, you get the top face of the cube and so on. On the screen now you should see what the code looks like to create a cube mesh as uh, taken from one of the, the built-in parts of the Ursina module. Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple though as uh, doing it for each cube within our mesh. Let's start off with just two cubes. Imagining you held them separately, it's pretty obvious that you now have 12 faces you need to display, although some of them might be hidden as they're the, the back faces of the cube. Now imagine you placed these cubes face to face. These two touching faces now cannot be seen as they obscure each other. So why slow our rendering process down by including them within our mesh? Now imagine for our 16 by 16 by 16 chunk, that's a lot of faces touching each other. So a lot of faces that no longer need to be drawn. In practice, what that looks like is that when we iterate through our list of blocks, we check each face against the block adjacent to it. And if another block 
so another face is present, we simply just don't add that face to the list that we pass our mesh to create. If a block gets destroyed, we can always add those faces back in after all. Now to get textures, all we need to do is take what is called a texture atlas, a larger image made up of all the textures you are using, and set the UV coordinates for each face to the correct coordinates on the image surrounding the texture we want, where 0, 0 is one corner of the texture atlas, and 1, 1 is the coordinate for the other corner. This is kind of like the UV unwrapping we did in part 3 of the introduction tutorial, although we're, we're setting the values manually ourselves rather than having a program like Blender do it for us. There is also the option of combining faces together. Say, for example, a square made up of nine one by one squares can become a square made up of a single three by three. This does make our life a bit harder when it comes to applying textures though, and performance was passable without using this in my case. From here, we need to work out how to generate the actual data going into each chunk and each mesh, or simply put, we need to generate our terrain. If we just selected terrain height randomly, the whole thing would be a mess, looking kind of like a TV static, I suppose. Instead, what we need is a random function that follows certain rules and sticks to a certain kind of pattern even if it has random variations within that pattern. The Perlin noise function is perfect for that, and a module already exists for it. I'll put the install command in the description. With this module, all we need to do is set a random seed, then when we pass it a coordinate, it will give us a strength value, as can be visualised with this image. We may want to layer different levels of detail here, just to get larger mountains while still having small variations, like hills and dips and so on. From there, all we need to do is turn these uh, strength values into heights of blocks in our 3D lists, and add layers of dirt, bedrock, stone and grass. And these are all handled pretty much the same way just with uh, different UV coordinates from our texture atlas. We can even add snow if we do a height check when placing grass down and make it a snow block instead above a certain height. And then to develop this further, we can set rules for ore spawning at each height, then randomly replace blocks in that list with ore blocks. If we want to create trees, we can just set up a list with all the necessary block positions, then add these blocks randomly on top of grass throughout the world. This is working pretty well now, but if we added the default first person controller, it would just fall straight through our terrain. And if we decided to give our terrain a collider, everything would run far too slowly due to the sheer amount of faces that need to be checked every time we raycast. Luckily, our geometry follows a pretty regular structure, so we can tell exactly which faces a ray could hit without checking all of them, just using a bit of vector maths and a process checking each cube as we travel down the ray. This visualisation shows it quite well, where each grey cube is a check done against a face, or cube boundary in the case of air. As you can see, significantly less checks than if we were to check every single face within the mesh. All that's left is to plug this collision detecting into the first person prefab, then update the meshes for our chunks whenever a new block is placed or destroyed at the, the location that the player's looking at. Just a disclaimer, while this is the optimal way for checking collisions in my opinion, it can be quite complicated to set up. So there is another way where you can use entities just for the terrain that's really close to the player, and we can give those entities a collider. And that would be the basics done. We've made something similar to the initial Minecraft releases. There's always more we could do, 
such as adding our own game mechanics or mobs and so on, but we've given ourselves a good platform to expand, without the limitations of the other implementations you may have seen on YouTube. Infinite Terrain is also a good area to look at, which I'm currently working on a bit. What you can see here is the terrain entities almost acting like a conveyor belt, so moving and generating new terrain as the player moves. It's quite buggy as you can see, and needs a lot of optimization still, um, but yeah, you get the idea. And uh, yeah, now that's it for today. It's not quite a step-by-step -step coding guide, but I will probably make something like that once I've finished the introduction tutorial, as there are a lot of tools we need to cover first, especially uh, mesh generation. Um, thank you for watching, and as always, please like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.